Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for the next session of our Preparing Your Ranch for Drought webinar series. Just a few things before we get started. I'm Miranda Meehan. I'm the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist with NDSU Extension, and I'm one of the speakers today. But a few housekeeping things. Um, all these webinars are recorded and will be posted at www.agndsu.edu backslash drought. So if you miss something, you can go back and find the recordings for this and any of our other webinars there. Um, please use the chat to dis discuss ideas among yourselves. Um, if you want everybody to see that, make sure that you have selected all panelists and attendees when you're typing in there. Otherwise, only the panelists are gonna see what you put in there. And then for questions, make sure to put those in the Q&A box so that we can make sure that we get those all addressed at the end. And we'll be holding those questions to the end. Um, and our next we webinar is next Thursday, same time, March 11th. And we will be talking about herd management and reduction strategies. So as I said, we're gonna be talking about livestock water considerations today. I'm Miranda Meehan and I'll be speaking and joining me is Dr. Gerald Stucka, our Extension Veterinarian and Livestock Stewardship Specialist. Yeah, thanks, Miranda. So Miranda and I are gonna switch back and forth a couple times here, but it's good to be with you this afternoon. And I think everyone in the audience know, understands how critical water is for livestock. And so just a couple of statistics here to keep in mind that most of our bodies and the bodies of livestock animals are, are water. If you think about it this way, when we look at that third bullet point of 10% loss of body water equals death, we sometimes get scouring calves or calves with diarrhea in the spring. And if they're 10% loss on a, even on a hundred pound calf, that's 10 pounds of water that they've lost. So think about that as you try and rehydrate an animal that's really dehydrated to that point and how difficult that is and how much water it actually takes to rehydrate an animal. Another issue that comes into this discussion is when we talk about shrink, when we transport cattle and how easy it is for an animal to lose 50 pounds or more just by not having enough water and being on transport. So it's a critical issue for livestock and it's, it's important for understand for us, not only the health, health situations, but how important water is for the life and health of that animal. So these are just, gives you an idea of the water requirements based on you know, what their production category is and based on how big they are. You can see here some references, for example, a dry cow and heifer, the difference between when the outside temperature is 60 versus 90. At 90 degrees, they're drinking twice as much water as they were when they were drinking at uh, 60. And I'll, I'll just drop down here maybe to finishing cattle because this is sometimes where it becomes really critical. And again, just look at the difference. Let's take a big 1,000 pound animal the difference between 60 and 90, again, is, is doubled. And one of the things that we see in, in animals, especially in feedlots, a lot of times we have these automatic waterers and there's a lot of times not enough space around those waterers for them to drink many at a time. And so the issue of that animal being able to get enough water intake when it's really warm and humid becomes really critical when we see how much they actually need. And, and how much water has to be available for several animals at a time. So critical issue, this is just an idea of how much they actually consume. So we're talking mostly today though about water quality as it relates to cattle on pasture. And, and uh, many of us have lived and <laughs> used water. Well, it's, it's an is interesting issue. In North Dakota, we call them uh, water holes. In Texas, they call them tanks. In Kansas, they call them ponds, but they're basically all the same thing. They're just kind of a dugout in which water runs off the, the uh, hills and, and into this dugout or tank or pond and carries everything with it. So obviously there can be many different things in that water that's now being consumed, not only by, by adult cattle, but also calves as well. And there can be bacteria in there there can be E. coli, salmonella, which would be a very important pathogen to consider. E. coli is more of an issue with young calves, not so much with adults, but salmonella can impact cattle at any stage of life. And, and it's also a human health impact as well. Even leptospirosis, which can cause abortions in cattle can be, uh, can be significant in some of these waters. 
parasites, we think of parasites, sometimes we think of internal parasites, you know, that are on grass, but we actually have parasites that may, uh, that have li- will have survivability and livability in water as well. Cryptosporidium is one of them. And cryptosporidium is usually involved with calf scours again. Giardia is another one that can be involved, particularly in young animals again. And the one we're going to spend a little bit of time on later is the, uh, we tend to call it blue-green algae blooms or uh, cyanobacteria. And really what it is, it's the toxins that are produced by cyanobacteria that can cause some pretty significant death loss uh, if they're present. So just to uh, approach, approach this issue a little bit, I mean, one of the, we need to pr- provide some context for how you avoid some of these, some of those issues that we just talked about from taking place. And, you know, obviously it's providing fresh water. And we know that's not always the easiest thing to do, but with many of the programs we have today, many ranches and operations have upgraded their watering facilities whether it's underground piping, whether it's hauling water. But the important part of this slide is that when we exclude livestock, for example, from a water hole or dugout, whatever we want to call it, when we exclude the livestock and so they're, they're not uh, dropping manure and urine and all those different things right in the water, then it, it makes that water much more fresh, if you will. It reduces E. coli, Uh, If we treat for bacteria at the same time, we can reduce not only E. coli, but obviously other bacterial pathogens as well in a significant way. And when we're using this fresh water that we're pumping, we're not, we're not taking all, when you exclude the livestock, we're not taking all those nutrients that are involved in runoff like nitrogen and phosphorus. And even for that matter in this, what we call the total dissolved solids category. So Providing that fresh water, excluding the livestock from that pond that we're pumping from can really make a difference on on water quality. You know, this is a really interesting slide. When I looked at this slide, (laughs) and this is Miranda's slide, and I thanked her for putting this in because if you think about this, let me just focus on clean water increases average daily gains. Let's look at the calf uh, slide there. Uh, 0.3 to 0.33 pounds per head per day. This slide indicates to us that having clean water is just as important as implanting a calf in the spring. I mean, that's, that's the uh, level of significance that clean water can, can bring to these livestock. And for yearlings that are running on grass, you know, a little bit less, but they're bigger animals anyway, some anywhere from 0.18 to 0.24 pounds per day. That is a huge improvement in gain just from clean water alone. So, and part of that, when cattle have access to clean water, what happens to the intake? They eat more, okay? And cows will milk more and thus calves will gain better. So a very important slide to, to ponder. So now we're gonna move into what is drought impact in terms of water? Um, first thing we'll talk about is availability of water. And then we're gonna talk into talk about the most common quality concerns that we see in the Northern Great Plains. And so that would be total dissolved solids or TDS, sulfates and cyanobacteria. And so when we talk about total dissolved solids, that's the salt component or the mineral component of our water. And in some places in North Dakota and it's natural, it's naturally occurring in our aquifers, it's naturally part of our geology. So we have a higher risk, especially in the Southwest part of the state of having high levels of total dissolved solids and also sulfates, which is one of those salts that can be toxic. And we'll talk about those, the specifics of these a little bit further. Um, the other thing is that cyanobacteria, when we have prolonged dry periods, it supports the growth of that, that bacteria or that algae that can be toxic. Um, Looking at our most recent drought here in North Dakota, um, in the peak of our 2017 flash drought um, at at the end of July, you see that a lot of the state, the western part of the state was hit hit hardest by this drought, was reported being very short on surface water. And so as we think about this and prepare for a drought, we wanna think about strategies to make sure that we have adequate water for our livestock out out on our range and pasture land. 
And not only is this important just for the livestock um, having enough water and that quality of water, but also it opens up access to forage resources that we might not be able to use otherwise if we don't have water in those, in those pastures or on that, in that rangeland anymore. And so what are some of those options for making sure that we can still have access to those resources? Um, and so thinking about the short term solutions as we're maybe preparing for a drought this year is as much as we don't wanna do it, hauling water is an option. Um, I know people groan about it, but if you can't use a whole pasture because you have no water, you're losing a lot more than you are at the expense of time of hauling water. Um, and so if we're gonna be hauling water, we need to think about tanks um, and barriers to keep those livestock out of those tanks. Um, whether those are, are another option is portable tanks. You can see a picture of a portable tank option on this slide. Um, another thing that we sometimes don't consider is clean hauling equipment. Sometimes we wanna use old spray tanks to haul water and we might have issues with the residues in those tanks. So making sure whatever you're using to haul that equipment is also safe and, and clean. Um, some producers I know have used temporary pipelines as well as temporary um, tanks or portable tanks. And so that's another option that we can use. And then the, other, the, the last is if we don't have the water there and we don't have another a short term option, we might have to move livestock to a place that water is readily available. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's on that's used any of those solutions, but it'd be interesting. I think those of us on would be interested to, to hear what you've done in past drought. So if you wanna put those in the drought or in the chat box and we can see some other solutions. Um, looking long-term, you know, putting in that infrastructure, I think when we talk about rangeland and grazing infrastructure, the biggest bang for your buck comes out of adding water infrastructure. It opens up so many different things for you, whether it's additional grazing resources, um, flexibility in your grazing system. And obviously we've seen in the, from the slide earlier that those gains too. So it, it pays for itself in the long run. And there's a lot of data that supports that. Um, so whether that's um, connecting to a well, rural water, or um, installing pipelines and the infrastructure that goes with that. And there's lots of programs out there that will help you um, cover, help with cost share for these type of, this type of infrastructure. So now we're gonna move in and chat a little bit more about the specific water quality concerns that, that we see during droughts. So again, that reflection on 2017 drought, and this is just from North Dakota, um, but if you look on the right, there's a, or there's a photo from an article and that's from Canada, but we've seen this was pretty common during that 2017 flash drought in the Northern Great Plains is there was lots of report of livestock death due to, to high sulfates in, our, in water sources. And, and it caught a lot of people off guard. It wasn't something they were prepared for. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about that um, is what we're hoping people will be more prepared this year if, if our drought does progress. Um, so, as part of our efforts with an extension to help address the drought and provide solutions, we promoted a lot of water screening and testing. And so our county agents in 2017 during that drought um, collected 126 field tests or field screenings of water. So they used a TDS meter similar to this one here, which is probably difficult for you to see, but um, a, a handheld TDS meter, they're around $100, um, you can get a decent one. At, to screen, to do a field screening. And if that field screening reached a, th a certain threshold, then water samples were collected. We collected 94 water samples and of those 82 of them were toxic for, to livestock and the livestock had to be, to be moved or another water source had to be developed or found. Mm -hmm. And Jerry, do you wanna talk about some of the other impacts we've seen in 2017? Yeah, just briefly. Uh... I'm still focused on that sulfate in the water in Saskatchewan cattle. And so it can happen in North Dakota as well, obviously. And so I think what Miranda's driving at it. We need to pay attention to our water source, especially in these dugouts. We get under dry conditions and they get, and dehydration occurs in, the, in these dugouts. And now we got more total, total uh, dissolved solids than we ever thought could happen. And that's obviously what happened up there in that Saskatchewan. The flip side of it is a little bit that 
when cattle are deprived of water, and I actually had this happen to us with one cow a couple of years ago, we moved a group of cows and one got left behind with, I don't know how it happened, but with three calves and she went a couple of days without water and she was very thirsty. So what happens is when cattle don't get enough water and then they're all of a sudden allowed to have water, then you can actually get into a, a salt toxicity issue where the brain actually swells a little bit as well. So it, it can work both ways. And especially when you got heat and high salt content in the water, they're not drinking enough, it's hot, they need to drink more. And so it's, it's different from sulfates, just pure sulfates, but salt toxicity can be an issue as well. And I also had another case a couple of years ago where the cattle had no access to salt. This is not so much with water, but had no access to salt for a long period of time. And then they were fed ad lib, just put out a bunch of salt blocks and uh, into, into a certain number of cattle. And we had actually had salt toxicity in those cattle as well because they ate so much salt because they were craving for it. So these things can lead to death in cattle that you might not expect. So this is it, these tables that we talk about are always so interesting and they're not always uniform across every reference you might find, but these are certainly recommendations that not, not we, but that have uh, come up as some guidelines for what we think is safe or not safe. So if you're looking at TDS, again, total dissolved solids, and like Miranda defined that for us at the beginning, usually we're okay. We should be fine when it's less than 3,000. When we go to three to 5,000, we probably still aren't gonna see a whole lot going on. But what you might start seeing when you creep above there, you'll, you'll have cattle that become loose. I mean, this, it's almost like an osmotic diarrhea that occurs when they're trying to get rid of these salts, it drags fluid out with it as well. And so that's when we start getting into trouble. And then even beyond that, especially if you get heat and cattle are craving water, they're gonna drink water that's even higher in TDS. And that can, that's what I was referring to earlier about causing brain damage. So over the past couple of years, extension agents across North Dakota have been monitoring water sources with a handheld TDS meter. And this is a, some of the data from 2020, just looking at the difference between water sources. And so the blue bars are surface water and the red bars are groundwater. And you see on average that our groundwater is lower than our surface water in total dissolved solids. And then also it remains, there's less fluctuation throughout from month to month throughout that grazing mm -hmm. period in comparison to our surface waters. And so one thing that happens with, during a drought with our total dissolved solids is that salt component of our water is always there. Mm -hmm. But when that water evaporates, it becomes more concentrated. So we see a fluctuation. We can see a fluctuation in those amounts of salts during a drought scenario as they increase. It's similar to having a glass of salt water and the water dissolves and you still have that salt residue in there because the salts are still going to be there. They're not going to dissolve with or evaporate with yeah. the atmosphere. And so this chart, it may be, seem a little skewed. This is the same from the same project, um, looking at just surface water alone. Um, I'm gonna point out that this high um, here in June was just one source. So that source was not one, one site really threw this off. Um, and that's this, that site did, wasn't monitored throughout the, the grazing period because after we had this really high reading, it was, I, it was astronomical, um, but after we had that high reading, then the animals were removed from there. So we did not continue monitoring mm -hmm. that site. And so I know we think that we get a little rain and some runoff that if we had poor water quality early in the season, that that's gonna help. And it will help to an extent, but it's not gonna have a dramatic influence on that overall water quality necessarily. So it makes it really important that we continue to monitor throughout that grazing period. So how do we monitor? Um, I talked about one of the tools and I recommend is using a TES or electric conductivity meter to screen our water samples or waters and they're affordable, it's easy to use, and it can give you a baseline and 
instead of sending a sample to a lab every, every month. Or you can go out as you're checking pastures, check your water as well. Um, if you have a reading that's over 4,500 parts per million, um, since there can be some variability and some things in our water that comp confounds the readings within, with these meters, we, want, we recommend you submit to a lab for further analysis. Um, and the one thing that I really stress is before you start using one for the, for the year, make sure that it's calibrated properly and that you're getting proper readings off of that. And we have some videos that can, with, it, that, with an extension and publication that steps you through that process. Also, most meters do have a calibration solution that they come with that, that'll help you through that process as well. Um, and just as a rule of thumb is that sulfates, with, when we're looking at our TDS, sulfates are typically 60% of the TDS, but that's not necessarily the case everywhere. That's just what we've seen in North Dakota. And so I, it's, and it's not a hard and fast rule. So I don't, I would, there's other methods we can use to look at those sulfates a little closer. Yes, yeah, so it's to uh, zero in on the sulfate issue a little bit more. And remember that they are component of the total is all solids, but sulfates by themselves present some unique issues in terms of the health of the cattle. And again, these are guidelines, cattle and sheep, total salt from the diet should be around no greater than actually 0.4%. And then we also have different sources of sulfur comes from not only the diet, but the water as well. I underlined that concentrate, 85% um, concentrate ration for a reason. And that's because as a rumen pH decreases, which it does with a concentrate diet, the amount of H2S or hydrogen sulfide gas in the rumen gas cap increases. And so that's why the, the parts per million and the, the, the diet may be a little bit less in sulfur just so we avoid the, those bacteria that, that uh, convert that sulfate, sulfates into H2S gas. So it might, it's a little bit different depending on what diet they are. And again, these are just recommendations concerning sulfates alone, less than 500 parts per million in calves and less than 1000 parts per million in mature cattle. But again, depending on the diet. Just wanna talk about specifically about some of the issues surrounding it. One of the things that we we're pretty sure what happens with some of these high sulfate water sources is that Molybdenum, which is another element, combines with sulfate, and then it it messes up our uh, messes up livestock's ability to absorb copper and even release copper. And so, one of the symptoms you might see in a, in a group of animals that there might be high sulfates, and you're not really noticing anything, anything, but you might start experiencing some issues associated with copper deficiencies, and that's health related, immune status related, even sometimes coloring of cattle is related to copper deficiencies. One of the things we talked about, and this is not written in stone necessarily, but black cattle tend to get a little bit of a reddish tinge to their hair coats. Uh, now that doesn't tell us that that's copper deficient, but it's one of those signs that can result when we have this situation with high sulfates and it combines with, with molybdenum. The other thing too would be loose stools. And then finally, when some of these uh, water, water issues become high enough in parts per million with sulfates, we actually see central nervous system symptoms. And I think the next slide, do I have a picture of that? I think, yeah. So just looking at an animal with central nervous system problems, you can't always make a diagnosis. I mean, we have everything from rabies to lead toxicity to thiamine deficiencies to nervous coccidiosis. So we're not always sure, but and when we when we look at an animal and we're, we recognize, make the diagnosis that it's something wrong in their central nervous system, which is obviously the brain. And we, we know that there may be, be being fed water or, or some byproducts that are high in sulfates. Some of the things that we, we think about quickly are a, a disease we call polioencephalomalacia. And that just means that parts of the brain are actually undergoing a little bit of necrosis. And, what, go to the next slide, um, Miranda. Th this is just a little bit of a schematic to how we think this actually takes place. Now, there, there may be some that don't necessarily believe in this inhalation theory, but when high sulfates are taken in, it's, it's uh, reduced to uh, 
it ends up being converted into hydrogen sulfide gas. And we talked about that gas cap earlier. And so what animals do, the ruminant animals naturally eructate. And so they eructate hydrogen sulfate gas, sulfide gas. And it's believed that some of that gas is actually inhaled with that eructation process and, go, and goes to the, to the lungs, which is rapidly absorbed. And hydrogen sulfide gas is extremely toxic to cells and particularly cells that ha have a high oxygen requirement like the central nervous system. And that's why you tend to see central nervous system problems associated with, with hydrogen sulfide gas that we have uh, characterized as polyencephalomalacia. There's another term we use. It's the same term, but it's a little bit different. Thiamine deficiencies also can result in polyencephalomalacia. Just a little bit different pathophysiology with that one, but this one specifically related to sulfates. Okay. This is a, and, and I, I intended to put a normal brain on here. This is an abnormal brain where I've taken that brain and I've just cut it in half uh, from front to back. So it's what we call a sagittal section of the brain. So you can see all these little divisions in the brain. And what, what you should see as you go to the outside there uh, in one layer, that con there, that layer, that layer should be much more developed, much thicker. And we're actually getting necrosis. It's called cortical necrosis of the brain. And so that, that, <laughs> We now understand why we see some symptoms related to central nervous system disorder because that's what it is. So anyway, I just thought you'd be interested in looking at a brain that, that was diagnosed with polyencephalomalacia. Okay. So how do we monitor sulfates? Um, again, the best way is sending a sample to the lab, but but a, a nice, easy way that we can, a tool that we can have on hand is tulfa, uh, sulfate test strips. You can get a packet of 100 of them for around $40 um, on Amazon. I've seen them. And so they're, they're accessible and it gives you a range. It's like using a litmus test strip in chemistry when you're in high school. Um, so it gives you a different color depending on the range you're in. And we recommend that if you're in that range um, around that 800, if it's over, if it's over 800 parts per million to submit to lab for further analysis, just to get a more accurate number for that. The other thing we are, we're gonna talk about is cyanobacteria. And this last year we had a number of cyanobacteria blooms across the state of North Dakota um, and and they started happening a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. We had warmer weather. Um, we think maybe some of the flush of the fall flooding the previous year um, brought nutrients into some of our water sources. And so what causes a cyanobacteria is excess nutrients in that water source, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus. And kind of like your salts, once they're there, they're very difficult to get rid of, um, especially the, that phosphorus com component, because that ties into that, the soil particles within that water source or the, and so once those get stirred up, it turns, stirs up that phosphorus and it's becomes resuspended in that water source. And so it's very difficult to get rid of those nutrients without putting in some type of per, perennial buffer, excluding livestock, um, because they're adding nutrients as well as just nutrients that are coming in from runoff. And so once you have had a cyanobacteria bloom, we really want you to monitor those sources closely. Blooms can develop very rapidly under the right conditions. And so we see those hot, dry conditions. Um, if we have a shallower water source, we used to say that around, around July, the 4th of July is when we would start to see them, but we've been starting, we've been seeing them mid June the last couple of years. So is monitoring earlier and the, this, this site in particular, I was out doing some field research and one day we're, no, there was not bloom. The next day we came back, had lunch at the spot and the, this bloom was present. So they develop very, very rapidly mm -hmm. and can be toxic yeah. to a wide range of animals and humans. Yeah, that's right, Miranda. And sometimes they're not as dramatic as this even. Sometimes they can fool you a little bit. And in fact, a couple of years ago, I remember Lake Erie that, that big lake. We usually don't see it in big ponds of water, do we, Miranda? We just, so I don't know exactly what's happening. I guess the message is 
don't think you're safe just because you have a huge area that your cattle water in because it can occur in large bodies of water as well. And it doesn't have to look this bad for you to have a bloom. And what we're talking about is these algae, we call them blue green algae because that's the color it looks like, but it takes certain species of these cyanobacteria to produce toxins. And so uh, the, to and, and this <laughs> the unfortunate part of these, this toxicity that you rarely get a chance to even see a sick animal, they're usually dead. And it's neurotoxins and hepatotoxins, which means toxic to the liver. And neuro obviously means toxic to the brain. So the symptoms are usually dead cattle. And if you have even an inkling that there's been an, uh, an algae bloom that looks something like this or not even this bad, be real concerned. The other thing too is that other mammals can be harmed as well, dogs in particular, human beings. Uh, so this is nothing to uh, ignore. It's a, it's a critical issue to always be aware of in these bodies of water that our livestock are, are watering out of. So unfortunately, because there's so many different type of algae and not all of them produce mm -hmm. a toxin, visual observation is really the best way to monitor for a cyanobacteria bloom. Um, there are tests for it. For the toxins, they're very expensive and there's not very many labs that do them. I think the, the one that we, we would use would be in, in Florida. So it's, it's pretty spendy. Um, the veterinary diagnostic lab at NDSU can look at, they'll take, if you send in a sample, they'll, they'll look at it for the presence of the LGBT species that produce those toxins, but we don't know a toxin level that are, if that toxin is for sure present. We just know the species that produce that toxin are present. But due to how rapid these toxins can act, mm -hmm. it's, we don't, it's, you don't want to take the risk. So what we typically recommend is if you see a bloom or you think you have a bloom, remove, ant, remove those livestock from, from that pasture or, or exclude them for that water source so they can't access that water source and, and utilize a different water source until, at least until you can get it tested and know what you're dealing with. Um, and unfortunately, there's no research on on um, on intake levels of toxins and thresholds, so it's really a guessing game, and it's not it's not a game that we like to play with, I guess. Um, so, if you are are wanting to sample a water source, um, if you've screened it and you have a high TDS or sulfates, or you think you have a cyanobacteria bloom, there's some we have developed this water. Livestock Water Testing Guidelines to step you through the process. Um, this one also has some of the common labs that are in North Dakota and some pr and the pricing for those labs and what you would ask for because some of them have different um, screenings that they, they would use. Um, and so we want to be sure that we're sampling, we're, we're sending in enough water, that we're sending it in a clean plastic bottle. Um, so if you're gonna use a bottle that you have, a water, you wanna want use a water bottle. We don't wanna use a pop bottle or a Powerade bottle because those have electrolytes and things and then that could throw off, this, throw off the readings. Um, and if you're sending a sample in for cyanobacteria, we're collecting that sample. We wanna use caution. We wanna use, make sure we're wearing gloves when we're collecting that. And those samples, because the bacteria will break down, we need to send those overnight on ice. And so when we're sending those samples, we wanna think about timing. We don't wanna send a sample to the lab and send it out on Friday. We wanna wait until Monday to send that out so that they get it in a timely fashion and, the back, and they can still conduct the tests or the analysis that they need to conduct to tell you if those, if those toxins could be present. When you get a, a water testing report back, they all look a little different. Um, the things that when we're doing a water test for livestock that we would we want to include or look at is you know the, the total dissolved solids, the sulfates, um, pH, you can do nitrates as well. Nitrates typically aren't a huge issue, um, but they can be if you're next to a place that might ha have high runoff from, from cropland or, or from tile drainage, potentially there's that potential there. So you can you can also run that and then uh, and those would show up, um, this is what you would get. So this is from the veterinary diagnostic lab at NDSU. We have our sample IDs, um, the nitrate, total dissolved solids, sulfate, and pH. 
And this was, these samples were taken in Southwest North Dakota, um, I think in 2017 is when these were done. And so you see that we have some pretty high levels of total dissolved solids and of sulfates on some of these water sources. So alternate water sources needed to be looked into for, the, for several of these locations. Now this is from a different laboratory. Um, you see it looks a little bit, a lot, or quite a bit different. It's a little bit harder to find things on this one compared to the one from a veterinary diagnostic lab. But so we have our pH here and they had um, other minerals looked at as well. Um, we have our sulfates here and then our total dissolved solids. And this one was for a confined a feedlot. And so the sulfates, well, wouldn't be a concern if we were grazing in a grazing situation, they might be impacting mm -hmm. performance here because of the, that lower threshold when we're on a high concentrate diet. So just kind of in summary, things to think about as we prepare for this grazing season or is, you know, if we think we have water quality concern, we wanna restrict or eliminate access to that water until we've, at least until we've had a test taken and develop an alternate source if possible. Um, providing and using alternate water sources if those tests come back and they're high in total dissolved solids or sulfates. And in the long term, you know, looking into developing a water source that's not only going to improve your water quality, but your livestock performance. Yeah, just to follow up a little, Miranda, too, and, and environmental conditions change so dramatically throughout the grazing season. Um, so heat and humidity become an issue. Dehydration in some of these stock ponds become an issue. So it'd be nice to at least have a, a plan in place. What am I going to do if I think I'm getting in trouble? And that's what Miranda's trying to portray and communicate here. What's, what's your backup plan in think, case things don't go well this summer? We've, we hope and pray they do. We hope and pray that, that we'll get some rain, but, and that makes a difference for us, but this water quality issue can't be over overemphasized. Yeah, especially when we consider that we had some poor water quality this fall at yeah. a lot of sites in North Dakota, yeah. and we had little to no runoff with the snow cover that we have currently. Yeah. So there's not going to be an improvement this spring. Is, so we want to be testing right away this spring before we're putting livestock out on some of these some of these pastures and using these water sources. And so and I think we're, we can open up for questions if, any, if there are any questions. Uh, and there's Jerry's and my contact information. Uh, be before we head into questions, I'll just kind of do a quick reminder that our next webinar again is next Thursday at one central time. And we'll be talking about herd management and reduction strategies. Thank you. Well, there are a few questions. Hi, this is Carl Hoppe. I there's a few questions that came up in the uh, chat box as well as the question and answer, but um, one that I'd like to repeat for you is, what might be the epigenetic concerns in the cow, bull, or future breeding stock if forced to consume water with TDS levels up to 3,000 parts per million? Did I hear that question right, Carl? Say that again. What might be the epigenetic concerns in the cow, bull, or future breeding stock if TDS levels are up to 3,000? Yeah, I got the answer for that one. We don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, think about this. We are just beginning to understand a little bit better about genetic expression. And there's, a, there's an environmental influence on genetic expression. And when it comes to water quality alone, I would expect there would be one, but I, I don't know the significance of it. I don't know what what levels it would impact genetic expression what you're talking about so but undoubtedly there there is an influence we're just not sure specifically what the impact or what the specific answer would be as to the impact today but yes it's a concern definitely is uh, there's a question that would go to miranda perhaps and that is where do i go to to get cost share for water developments Okay, there's several, several opportunities. Um, ones for that would be more widespread would be um, NRCS, um, your local soil conservation districts, 
Um, I know in North Dakota, depending where you're at, you might qualify for some programs through the, the Game and Fish. Through this, uh, one of that I can think of specifically might be the Save, Your, Save Our Lakes program. And that one, I know in some instances, can provide 100% cost share. So that's a really good program if you can utilize that. Um, those are the ones that come to, to mind right away. I do know that some of our NGOs, such as Ducks Unlimited and I don't think Pheasants Forever has anything that co would cover water at this time, but those, they, they might have an opportunity too. So definitely reach out to, to those folks and don't be afraid to see what they have. And usually your soil conservation districts are probably the good place to start because they're aware of those other opportunities and work with those other folks. Great. Um, here's another question. So uh, does livestock water quality, well, does water quality affect all species? In other words, sheep and horses? Are they more susceptible or less susceptible? That's the question that was asked. Um, well, they're all susceptible to it. I mean, mammals have kind of the same susceptibility when it comes to these water quality issues. I would say that the sulfate issue is perhaps a little bit unique to ruminant animals just because of the production of hydrogen sulfide gas. And, that, and how that's absorbed. So that'd be one of those issues that may be unique to ruminants. But the other th things we talked about, cyanobacteria, total dissolved solids, just water deprivation in, in general would certainly fit other species. Uh, there, there's, we got a few questions and here's another one that talks about uh, in a spring well development, it has some ruddy, it has, excuse me, in a spring well development, it has some rusty red mass floating in the water tank. Uh, is that safe to drink? The cattle don't appear to be having any problems or, or better yet, what is it? Is it iron bacteria? What, can you explain any of that? It's yeah, hard. so we but, actually uh, ran into that this summer. <laughs> um, I know one of our county agents worked with a producer that had uh, something like that. In that case, it was an iron bacteria and that's most likely with that red color, but if you're unsure, send a, send a test, a, a sample in for further analysis. Also taking pictures, that's helpful when you're sending something in or, or reaching out to your local extension agent for more information, because that helps us better diagnose what's going on or your veterinarian mm -hmm. if you're working with them. Carl, just let me follow up a little bit with that. And in, in some of these big tanks even that are fed from well water, you, you'll get algae growth in there, <laughs> a lot of it. But if you think about it, we shouldn't have some of the contributing factors that go into this algae bloom, presumably not high nitrates and not high phosphorus when we were taking it from a well, as evidenced by some of Miranda's work with well water. So you'll get algae growth in some of these well water tanks, but it seems doesn't, doesn't seem to be harmful at all. We just go ahead and take a fork and clean it out every so often. And there's some pretty good resources that can step, give you some solutions for preventing algal growth in those water tanks. Um, one of the simplest ones and that's relatively safe is using household bleach in those tanks. Or, you know, some people use goldfish. So there's, there's also some solutions there, but like Jerry said, that with, with those, it's not a cyanobacteria concern typically, it's just, it's just an algal growth mm -hmm. in those tanks. I have to ask, will the uh, Clorox solution hurt the goldfish? Well, I, I wouldn't recommend putting them in there together, probably. <laughs> you might have some dead fish if you put that in. I did have a comment here on copper sulfate that appears to be used at one time in the past. Is that still viable or is that something that's not recommended now or? It really depends on your state and their regulations in North Dakota. It, we want to be careful because it is a regulated substance. And so we want to make sure that we're not putting it on a water body that connects to other surface waters uh, because it kills off other living organisms in that water and not just that bacteria. Also, we run into issues where people use it improperly. And I've had a couple of years ago, I had a, a producer in one of the counties that had to redig his dugout because he, had, he added too much cough, copper sulfate. And so we wanna make sure that we're using it properly. Um, the veterinary toxicologist, Michelle Mostrom, right. also said you know, with caution that she's had many instances where because it kills the bacteria, the toxins are actually released when that bacteria dies 
And so if you put your animals in there too soon, we can actually have more death loss because of, of that toxicity. I think do we run into, especially in large bodies of water, I mean, just the amount you would need was, is, uh, it gets to be insurmountable. So yeah, I, I, it wouldn't be a solution I'd look to. So for cleaning out the small waters of the troughs of the small tanks, can you use hydrogen peroxide too, or is that not something? Mm, I'd, I'd more like Miranda, I'd probably just use bleach. And you know, in the feed yards, for example, you don't even really need to do that. You just take a brush and brush all the crud out as much as you can, drain the tank and, and go on. And you know, it's practiced much more in the feed yards. Even sometimes those of us that have automatic waters in our cow herd, we kind of ignore those things. And we go, when we look at them once or twice a year for how clean they are and <clears throat> about grosses is out a little bit. So I, I guess I'm reminding our cow calf producers that even those that aren't used very often can get pretty um, unsightly. And probably the water isn't as nice and fresh as we think it should be. And there is another question here. It says, uh, can water source lead to kidney stones or, or uh, urinary calculi? Can it, can it lead to urolis? Yeah. And that's assuming the content of the water, the minerals in the water, not, not necessarily a lack there of water. Yeah. Or, or maybe it did include that. But urinary calculi can be a problem, but I don't think it's related to water source. It's mostly related to diet. I'll just shorten my answer somewhat. Did you hear that? That I heard. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> thanks, Carl, for uh, moderating this session. And, and uh, thanks, Miranda. And thanks for everyone that's on. And this is a recorded session, so you can go back and, and look at it again, perhaps even during the summertime when it's uh, environmental conditions have changed. So thank you so much for being part of our program. And I'll hand it over back over to Miranda. As we, as we proceed, I guess the, the big take home, home that we, we have here is just you know, monitoring and there's some really simple tools to make it easy for monitoring your water quality throughout this, the grazing season. And I, I mean, whether or not we, the drought progresses, I think that it, it's valuable to continue monitoring our water. And the other, and, and it's pretty simple and it's pretty quick to, cheap test affordable. So it's well worth the value. Um, the other thing I want to remind those, those of you that are in North Dakota is that the majority of our extension agents have a TDS meter and several of them will also have sulfate test strips in their office. And they have, have um, sample kits to help you collect water if you want help with that. So if you need assistance with any of this, reach out to them and they're a great resource for you as we move forward through through the growing and grazing season. Mm -hmm.